So you want to buy a property, but you don't know how. And on top of all of that, you are super early on in the process. So you're probably afraid of making an appointment with someone like me, which you can do easily by using the link down below in the description. And you just want to know how to get started. Well, welcome to this complete beginner's guide to buying real estate in British Columbia, Canada. Now, a bunch of this information may apply to many places in the country and of course in the province, but my market that I service is Surrey and the Fraser Valley, which includes North Delta, White Rock, Langley, Abbotsford, and Mission as well. And then like most agents here in the Lower Mainland, we do cross over into other areas like Maple Ridge, Tri-Cities, even Coquitlam, Burnaby, and yes, Vancouver. So in advance, I'm going to apologize if not all of the information I give here today is relevant to you wherever you're watching from. But if you are new to the idea of owning real estate, scared about the whole process and living outside of my hometown of Surrey, BC, well, feel free to reach out anytime by email or text. And I would love the opportunity to then connect you with an agent that I know and trust in your market. And if you find any value in this video here today, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel as I try to consistently put out videos keeping the general public, just like you, totally up to date on the market. And with each of those maybe two or three videos each week that I put out, I will ask you to please click the like button in return for all of this free information in hopes that the YouTube algorithm will then help me push this content out to even more people just like you who are also hoping to one day soon become homeowners. And just to set a baseline, here is the basic agenda for this video. Number one, understanding agency and your relationship with your realtor here in British Columbia, where it is a whole lot different than any other province and any other place in the whole world. Second, we're going to look at determining your particular needs of what you're looking for out of real estate because, well, that's going to help you determine exactly what type of real estate you're looking for. Third, we're going to get into actually picking your agent to help represent you in your purchase because, again, here in BC, things are a lot different than other places and you will need a real estate agent in most cases. Fourth, I'm going to cover financing and what it takes to get a mortgage. If you're a cash buyer, great, but then you're probably not watching this video. So you're likely going to have a mortgage and we're going to go through that. Fifth is searching for a property, both online and in person. Six, I'm going to cover writing an offer and the important terms and conditions that you're going to be looking for when writing that offer. And last, I'm going to cover closing on your purchase, meaning actually paying for it and taking possession. And well, I would imagine as I blabber on here over the next little bit, I'm going to cover probably even more points than these. Okay, let's start off with number one an understanding agency, because as I mentioned, this is a whole lot different here in BC than any other province and likely anywhere else in the world, at least that I know of. And although I have other videos here on the channel about this topic, I'm going to give you as quick a rundown as I possibly can. The first thing you have to know in BC is that there is no such thing as limited dual agency, meaning that you cannot walk into an open house and use that agency agent, if they're the listing agent for that property, as your agent to purchase that home. There are very limited exemptions to this rule. And to my understanding, there have been none actually granted because you actually have to apply for an exemption to this rule. So generally speaking on all residential transactions now in the province of British Columbia, the buyer is going to hire their own agent to walk them through the process. And it will not be the same person or even team as the listing agent for that particular property. Next, you have to understand a document called the Disclosure of Representation in Trading Services. This is a disclosure that any real estate agent has to show you as their first point of contact before learning anything about you and your personal situation or before providing any personalized advice. This disclosure form covers a few things, particularly the fact that the realtor must not have any conflicts of interest in the purchase or sale process. They also have to be completely loyal to their clients and 
keep full confidentiality. And with continuous recent updates of this form, there is also a section that covers the new buyer rescission period that has just come into place here in 2023. But we'll get into that more a little later on. On this form, when the real estate agent discloses to the person that they're talking to that yes, indeed, they are talking to them as if they are already a client, or that if they are not a client, if they do choose not a client, in other words, if I'm already representing somebody else in the transaction and I cannot represent you, the agent then also needs to present a different form called the risks to unrepresented parties form. Basically, the way I look at that form is I've told you, go get your own realtor. You say, no, I don't want my own realtor. And then that form that shows you the risks of not getting a realtor, well, it's basically like saying anything you say can and will be used against you in a negotiation. So you should probably get representation for yourself. Along with that, you should also be presented with a privacy and consent form of which talks about things like the MLS system and the fact that you are aware that, that there will be certain aspects of your particular purchase that will go on the MLS system and could possibly be made public. So please just do me this one favor. Understand that if an agent does not present you with this form that we call the DORT, if they don't do that, they're already not in the minimum compliance required by the regulating bodies. Every agent should show you this before learning anything about you and before discovering what your needs are for purchase. And if they're not, again, they are out of compliance. This should not be a form that is presented to you when you are writing an offer. The next thing I want you to do is determine your needs. Write down an itemized list of everything you want and need in a property. And I mean really break this down to the nitty gritty. Here is my list of considerations that I get my clients to consider before we go out and look at any properties at all. And some of these are obvious, but some aren't. So get out a pen, write them down, and get ready. Because my itemized list includes what location do you want to buy? How many bedrooms do you need? What is the minimum or maximum amount of bathrooms? Do you need a den? What type of floor plan are you looking for? Is it open concept? Or do you like something a little bit more classic? What is your minimum square footage required? What age of building and or construction are you okay with? How much parking do you need and what do you want it to look like? Is it a single garage or is it under building parking or open street parking? Consider things like storage, the amount of current renovations either in the property or required which direction the property faces. That might sound silly, but it's really important to a lot of people. Do you need a yard? Is that yard fenced? Do you require or would you like a view? If you're getting into a strata property, are the strata restrictions the ones you are looking for? And will you enjoy the property if there are those restrictions set upon you? Again, in strata, do you require in-suite laundry? A lot of units, particularly older ones, don't have laundry inside the unit and it might be shared or you may have to go to a laundromat. What floor do you want to live on? Are you okay on the bottom floor? Do you want top floor or are you okay on any floor? Make a note of what type of flooring you prefer, even paint colors. Natural light could be very important to you. And how about appliances or included items, even breaking it down to fireplaces? Do you like electric or gas? And this is only the start of the list of items that might be important to you. More considerations could be how long is the commute from the area of which you're looking to work? Do you have churches or groups or activities that you go to that you will be frequenting so they may also be considered in your commute? How about coffee shops, walkability, parks? Do you like to spend time outside or hiking? And how close are family or friends that you will again likely be spending a lot of time with? And trust me, this list can keep on going. But now after you write out this list of what is the perfect property for you, I want you to categorize all of these factors into one of three groups. First, what are your must haves? What is it that is non-negotiable in your purchase? Second, which of these items or factors 
would be nice to have, but wouldn't necessarily be a deal breaker if the property either contained it or didn't contain. And then finally, which of those items are must not haves, meaning that they are total deal breakers. And since you have probably not yet focused on what you're not looking for, you might now add things to this list like, is there a power line corridor nearby? Is the street outside maybe that your balcony looks over a busy one? Do you now want to be in a cul-de-sac or do you not mind a collector street if you have kids playing outside? And yes, here in BC, you have to be aware of previous properties that were marijuana grow hops. And once you compile this entire list, there you have it. You should now have a pretty perfect picture of what your dream house will look like. But there is one more thing I also now want you to do with those must-haves. I want you to rank them because I can absolutely 100% for sure get you everything you want for almost any budget. As long as, for instance, something like area isn't a factor. So if you want to live closer to the city, you'll likely have to sacrifice certain things to fit your budget. That's right. You will at some point have to pick which one of these must-haves is most important. Is it the size of the home that you're buying or is it the age? Location could be a factor or the amount of bedrooms. Walkability or commute. Who knows? Those things could even be the same thing. All of these things often do not align and ordering these items will help you make a faster and better decision when you do actually start looking at properties in person. Okay, so now you understand agency and the type of property you are looking for. So you probably want to think about hiring a real estate agent to help you through the rest of the process and identify the right properties. But what is it that makes a good real estate agent? Well, that depends on what you think makes the good agent the right fit for you. Some people pick their agents because they are what we call in the business an area expert, meaning that they only focus on very tight areas to market and sell properties, which sure there is some truth to, but in my opinion, it does tend to be overrated to some degree. Because, for instance, my market here in Surrey, BC is something like 115 square miles. And, well, I work the entire city. And is someone more capable than myself if they only work South Surrey than if they work North Surrey? Personally, I don't believe so. But if I was an agent coming from downtown Vancouver into Surrey, I can see the benefit of using someone who knows the area. Some people pick their agent on how fancy their agent's car or Instagram life is, or even how many bus benches they have. But here are the factors I think you should consider when picking an agent to help you through your first purchase. Number one, how much experience do they have? Now, this can be years of experience, but this can also be number two, how many homes do they sell? Meaning how many clients do they have? When I got into the business, I was very, very new in my first couple of years, but I did join on with a mentor, and as a result, I saw 50, 60, 70 home sales a year, where if I had stayed by myself, I probably would have done the average four to five deals a year, and therefore the experience I gained over a very short amount of time was huge. And let's face it, if you're selling a home every week or every two weeks, you can give current up-to-date advice. And it is my opinion that if you are the average agent, which by the way, sells about six properties a year or one every two months, you may not be giving the most up-to-date advice to your current clients. Third, I would ask the agent where their business comes from. Sure, having a YouTube channel like this does get me some business, but the overwhelming amount of my business each year is consistently past clients that were happy with my service and referrals from those people and other business to business relationships. So sure, the guy with a big marketing campaign may have a ton of business, but the question for me is, are those people consistently happy and do they return to sell their homes from the person they bought it from? Fourth, are they giving you the right amount of time and advice that you deserve as one of their clients? 
One thing I absolutely hate to hear in this industry is I don't want to bother my realtor. So I'm just calling Steve on his listing instead. This is the wrong way to look at it. Your real estate agent is going to make a lot of money and their job is to help you buy a home. So if they're not willing to necessarily get out there and help show you properties and advise you on each one individually, you might want to consider hiring someone else. Fifth, you want to find out if the right fit for you is someone that works on a team or if they are a single agent. Personally, I work on a team for two reasons. One, my clients are always being serviced no matter if I'm available or not. And two, the only thing I want to do more than help my clients buy and sell homes is stay married and have a good family life. So working with an amazing team of other agents, we can switch off. And for instance, if I'm at soccer with my kids on Sunday morning and the perfect property came up for you Saturday afternoon on the market, I don't have to pick between you buying your perfect house and staying married and being a good dad. My team allows me to switch on and off so you, the client yourself, are completely serviced and I also get to have a life. But there is an argument to have a single agent that does not work on a team. And that argument is that every single time you have an interaction with your realtor, you're dealing with the exact same person no matter what. But again, the downside to that to me is, can I then as a single agent go on vacation? And what if you are trying to buy a house while I'm in Mexico? So do please consider whether or not the right fit for you is working under a team structure and hiring a group of agents, or if you're looking for that personal one-on-one -on -one touch with just one person. And six, and this one is often overlooked, do you like them? Do they like you? Do you get along? It is my belief that I should not work with any clients I don't like. And well, they probably shouldn't work with me. Often we are hired in this industry by people that think I am working against them just to get the price lower to get a sale. And I understand that side of the argument, but realistically, you need to hire someone who you trust and you feel has your best interest at their front of mind because being a real estate agent comes with fiduciary duty, just the same as it does with a lawyer or say, for instance, a doctor. Fiduciary duty means that we must place your needs ahead of our own. And last, even though I think much of my competition out there, many agents in the business are too chicken to use them. Yeah, I'm going to say that. I'm going to say too chicken. And many consumers think they are being smart by not having one. You should enter into an agency agreement with your agent called an exclusive buyer agency agreement. And there are many reasons for this. But that in itself is a very, very long video. So I might save that for another day. Or if you would like to talk to me or my team about hiring us, just go ahead and book a call using the link in the description below so we can get further into the benefits of an exclusive buyer agency contract. All right, next up, and this is probably the biggest factor for any buyer in today's market, financing. Starting off with determining what is your comfort level versus what is your actual affordability? Most buyers come to me and the first thing they say is, I do not want to be house poor. And I understand that. I totally get it. So we need to budget to find out what that monthly payment might look like. And once we find out the difference between what you can actually afford at your max and how comfortable you are making those payments, then we can relate those two scenarios to your overall purchase price. And for sure, this will get some criticism saying that, you know, obviously everything's unaffordable and that prices are always crazy high and that yes, interest rates are high in today's environment. But let me tell you, there is big differences out there depending on your type of employment. For instance, if you are younger and have a good job and expect some sort of raises to be coming for sure in the future, you may push your affordability to the max knowing that, I don't know, if you're an accountant, there might be certain raises coming at certain times. Or if you are on some sort of commission structure or bonus structure where you cannot always use all of your income to qualify for your mortgage, well, there's a really good chance that you can push the affordability envelope because your income might be higher 
then the bank will approve you for. But if you are a salary person and maybe in a union where you're not expecting large increases in the future or advancement in your career, well, then you really want to focus on the comfort level because there's a very good possibility that, well, those payments, they better be very similar for the foreseeable future. And how do you discover what your comfort level or affordability really is? Well, we're going to need to, at some point, talk to either a bank or a mortgage broker. Now, I do have an old video on the channel talking all about this that will break down this concept if you want to go back and find that particular video. But let me sum it up for you really quickly. There are five big Canadian banks in Canada. That is where an overwhelming part of the population gets their mortgages. So for instance, if you bank with the Bank of Montreal, well, you very well may want to get your mortgage there. But when you go to a bank, you have to understand that you're only dealing with that particular institution. So there may be some comfort level there because, well, your checks already go in and out of those accounts and it makes qualification possibly slightly easier than if you were to go the other option, which is to go to an independent mortgage broker. Now, what an independent broker can do is take you to all of those broker channel lenders out there, and there are a ton. And let me run this down for you really, really quickly. Banks like the Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank, and CIBC currently do not use independent mortgage brokers. TD and Scotiabank do. So if you went to an independent mortgage broker, they could still take you to TD or Scotiabank, but then they could also take you to something like 30 other lenders, non-bank mortgage lenders that will likely even get you a better deal. And the benefit of using a broker is, well, the broker and even the mortgage specialist at the bank are getting paid on the back end. There is no upfront cost. The person at the bank, however, generally gets paid by the bank obviously, and the broker will not get paid until you fund the mortgage. So there is a commission side of that business, which is pushing them to make sure that you're happy with their product or they don't get paid. Now, I have done both uh, and I've been happy with the different decisions that I've made at the time. But currently, given the market that's out there and my personal comfort level and knowing the knowledge that comes from my independent broker, that's where I get my mortgages right now. If you would like to speak with any of our preferred mortgage brokers, you can visit our website's resources page and reach out to any one of the brokers there. Or my recommendation is even to go ahead and fill out an application with Citywide Mortgage Services using the link in the description of this video. Next, let's talk down payments. Now the minimum down payment anywhere in Canada is 5%, but that only now goes up to $500,000, which doesn't get you a lot in my particular marketplace. So sure, if you want to buy a $500,000 condo, technically you can do that with as little down as $25,000. But when you go from 500,000 to a million, well, that portion now needs 10% down. And anything here in Canada over a million dollars requires a minimum down payment of 20%. And I will have you know that once you hit sometimes one, three, one, four, but definitely 1.5 million, some banks do require an even higher down payment from that amount forward. Now, down payments can come from many different places, and I'll let you have that conversation with the mortgage broker, whether it be a gift from mom and dad, savings, even RRSPs can be used towards your down payment given certain scenarios. And I'm gonna tell you right now, there are some government plans out there to reduce your down payment, and well, don't waste your time. Generally speaking, most people do not take advantage of these because sure, they do help you with your down payment, but then they reduce the amount of property that you can actually buy. And most people want to stretch the amount of property that they buy. So sure, go ahead and look into them. But the plans of the shared equity, for instance, the federal government shared equity plan, I'm going to suggest that you're probably not going to use them. Next, you're going to also want to talk to that broker about your fixed payment options or variable options. Now there are different types of variable options. Some of them just the interest rate change, your payment doesn't. And well, in today's market, that can be a really bad thing because your amortization 
will then get extended for your loan, meaning that you owe on that loan for a lot longer than the 25 years that you originally signed up for. Scotiabank is the only big bank that has a proper variable where every time the interest rate changes, so does your payment to compensate for that. But it is my opinion that most first time buyers should get into a fixed term mortgage. And usually that is for a five year period. Now fixed term mortgages do come with penalties if you want to break them. And the average mortgage gets either broken or the property gets sold within about four years. So you may want to be very careful on getting into a five year fixed mortgage if you don't think you're going to be in the property for at least five years. But you can pick one, two, three, four, or five year terms. There is even, I believe, a seven and a 10, but I've never had a client take them because the interest rates are so much higher. Again, the downside to the fixed side of things is if you break the mortgage, there will likely be very large penalties. The downside to the variable is that your payment may change and you may get different amortizations, which is not good. However, the variable rates usually come with a lot lower penalties, so that should be factored in to your financing equation. Next, let's talk CMHC. This is a Canadian corporation with a mandate to get people into housing, and basically what they do is they insure your mortgage. If you are less than 20% down, you are for sure going to have to pay for CMHC insurance. This cannot be paid for upfront and must be rolled into the mortgage. So you will be paying some sort of interest on it if you can't get to 20% down. However, with less than 20% down, you actually get a better interest rate. Why is that? Because as soon as you put 20% down, what a lot of banks will do is they'll still go buy that insurance and kind of not tell you about it and then just charge you a higher rate to pay for the insurance. So if you are buying a property under a million dollars, even if you don't think you have CMHC insurance, you likely do. But over a million dollars, those properties can no longer be insured. So that is again why the banks, they're now taking on more risk. They will likely charge you a little higher interest rate. And if you listen to your parents, you wanna avoid CMHC. Uh, at all costs. And trust me, I personally don't think that is the case. I think you should buy real estate as soon as you possibly can and stay in it for the rest of your life. And if you have to pay a five, six, seven, even a $10,000 CMHC fee, it's probably worth it. Oh, and right along with financing, you're probably wondering what expenses you will have to take on when it comes time to purchase. Well, let's run down that really quickly as well. Number one, you're going to need a deposit. Now a deposit is negotiated within the contract. However, rule of thumb here in BC is that the deposit should be in and around 5%. So if you're coming with 5% down, uh, again, the example I used earlier, a $500,000 purchase, the deposit is likely going to be about 25,000 bucks. But deposit and down payment are not necessarily the same thing. For instance, if you were buying that same $500,000 condo and your deposit was 5% or $25,000, but you're putting 20% down, well, then on closing, you would already have paid your 5%, and then you need to bring the other 15% to make up your total down payment of 20%. Property purchase tax, well, that is something that you can't avoid. Sometimes called property purchase tax, sometimes called property transfer tax. The very quick calculation is 2% minus two grand. That's not the exact calculation. It's actually 1% uh, on your first 200,000, 2% on the balance. And then once you get up into $2 million properties or more, uh, it goes up from there. But I'm gonna assume that since you're watching this video, you're probably not buying a $2 million property. So as a rule of thumb, do just 2% minus two grand. That's probably gonna be your transfer tax. Now, if you're buying $500,000 or under, you are exempt from your property purchase tax if you are a first time buyer and qualify under that program. From 500,000 to 525, there's a sliding scale reducing how much property purchase tax you pay. But if you buy a property at anything over $525,000, you are for sure paying that property purchase tax. And as I say here to all of my clients, Alberta has oil. BC has property purchase tax. And well, there's just no escaping it because it is such a big portion of the government's revenue. And on a total side note, I actually really dislike the PPT because what they do is they bring it in saying, oh no, we won't make 
you pay a high tax. We'll only make you pay a very low tax. And then they introduced the really high taxes at $2 million. Well, it was not uncommon when the market got crazy that a lot of purchases were over $2 million. And then it even increases upwards from there. So as you buy more expensive real estate, sure, the property purchase tax go up. But over time, all of those properties are eventually going to get to those high levels. So it's a bit of a scam in my estimation, but it is a reality of owning property here in BC. Next, you're going to have to pay for either a lawyer or a notary. Now, my simple-minded way of explaining the difference between a lawyer and a notary is a notary can file all of the paperwork and get the property transferred into your name. A lawyer can do all of that and if anything goes wrong they can give you legal advice so my estimation is that you should always use a lawyer but often there are many conveyance lawyers that operate similar to notaries so my again suggestion is if you're going to hire a lawyer please go ahead and hire a full service law firm because often things don't go wrong only maybe once or twice out of the 100 transactions I do each year do we have to talk to lawyers and iron out some of the details. But in the event that you end up in one of those situations, you're going to be super glad that you're with a full service law firm. And one law firm that I recommend that does that exact thing here in Surrey is Buckley Hogan law office. I highly recommend them. You should check them out for yourself. And then again, go back to our resources page where we have other options like notaries and mobile lawyers. And I would set aside for a lawyer, uh, depend, it depends if you're doing a purchase or sale, if there's, if there's mortgages involved, all that stuff. But I would set aside about $1,500 or so in order to pay off the lawyer. So I like to say between my PPT and the lawyer's, set aside 2% on top of your actual purchase price. If you do successfully buy a property, there's a really good chance you're going to want to pay for an inspection. Now you have the option to do an inspection or not. That's totally up to you. If you choose not to do an inspection, someone like myself, if I was helping you, would make you sign a waiver saying, I told you to do an inspection uh, because I'm not a home inspector and we probably need a second set of eyes that knows what the heck they're talking about when it comes to things like roofing and foundations. Most inspections these days will run you between $500 and $600. I do find $550 is about the average. Now in inspection, are we looking for nickel and dime items like the doorknob being loose and I want the owner to replace the doorknob or the hinges on the, on the cupboard? No, we're not looking for that. We're looking for make or break items, meaning is there mold in the attic? Is the foundation cracked? These are things that would fundamentally change your position on the property and the home inspector finding out that the caulking might need replaced in one of the showers. Well, that's sure they're going to point that out to you, but that is not the value in it. And best case scenario, you find nothing wrong and all you've done is pay about five or 600 bucks for peace of mind. Next, when you're getting your financing done, you could be on the hook for your appraisal. My experience is that most independent mortgage brokers and banks these days are kind of funneling those appraisals through the back end so the bank is paying for them. But there is the possibility that you could end up with another, so again, say three to $500 for an appraisal to make sure the property is worth what you're offering on it. But you don't get to see that. That is now property of the lender. So keep that in mind. One thing I like to put on my list is movers. And you have to ask yourself if uh, I'm moving personally today, I would hire movers because, well, those days of hiring a budget truck and doing it myself, they're probably gone. But you're likely a first time buyer. So when it comes to movers, yeah, go pick up the U-Haul, get some buddies and make sure you don't give them the beer and pizza until after the move is done because movers, well, they can be quite expensive. I've seen quotes anywhere from three to $10,000 to get people moved depending on how much stuff they have in the size of their home. So if this is your first place, go rent the budget truck, get some friends, make sure you have some friends and hopefully they will help you make your move a whole lot easier and a little bit cheaper. Next, there will be adjustments. So part of what the lawyer does is they adjust for the portions of property tax strata and utilities of which were may already have been paid for or maybe you might be responsible for after you move in. But there's no reason why, for instance, if you move in on June 1st and property taxes are due on July 1st, that the owner that 
lived in the property for five whole months shouldn't pay five months worth of property taxes. And if you move in in August, property taxes are already paid. So again, those adjustments do need to be made. This should ideally not be a substantial amount. And again, that is taken care of by the lawyers on closing. And the last and most favorite one, GST. GST at this point is only payable on brand new properties. So if you're buying a resale property, which is the majority of what I do here in Surrey, well, you're not going to have to worry about that extra 5%. If you're buying something brand new, you are for sure going to want to talk to an accountant or whoever does your taxes to make sure you get a proper opinion on GST and how it applies to your purchase. So now you have a picture in your mind of the property you want. You have an agent, you have a broker. It's time to go shopping. But how does actually searching for a property work? Well, searching online, let me tell you right now, please get away from all of those Z sites, okay? Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of any paid site. There are great sites out there that show you a bunch of good information, but personally, I only use realtor.ca if I'm looking for properties and I'm not a real estate agent. Those pro properties on realtor.ca are not promoted in any way, one over top of another. It's just the information. Now, the downside to realtor.ca is it doesn't have necessarily all of the good information that you may get from some of those other sites. For sure, don't search on Google. I don't recommend it. You should stay away from it. Uh, so yes, Real Estate Weekly is an okay site. Zillow, uh, Zolo, uh, like I said, all the Z ones. But find the property you want first on a site like realtor.ca and then transfer to those sites to see if they can give you more information. However, when you hook up with somebody like me, we do have systems here as agents to send you not only all of the listings that fit your criteria and filter out all the other ones, but we can then also show you much more detailed information that you're not allowed to find on any of those sites. So your agent should be able to set you up on a proper online search with your criteria. And if they can't, again, you may want to reconsider which agent you're using. And then with a little bit of help from someone like me or my team, hopefully we can get you in to certain properties that you want to see. Private showings are for serious buyers. You can book a showing, generally speaking, anytime between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. any day of the week, and you will likely get access. In Vancouver, often the listing agent will be present. Here in the Fraser Valley Board, that is often just you, your agent, a lockbox, and free access to the home so you can discuss the home without having someone looking over your shoulder. But be prepared because you're gonna see some beautiful homes. You're also gonna walk into homes where you might want to not only throw out your socks, but maybe burn them later. People show properties in all sorts of different conditions. And really, you have to be okay with the fact that you're gonna see some stinkers. So generally speaking, what we will do is take our clients out and see three, maybe four properties at once if they are available to see. And then, hey, hopefully we find something you like. But if not, we can then again set up another time to go see more properties. And as you narrow down exactly what it is you want, we may even be running out if the new hot listing hits today at three o'clock, we might try and be in there by 5.30 tonight. So be prepared that when the good listings come, they come on the market and they sell still really, really quickly, even in a slow market. Next, open houses. A lot of people like to go to open houses so they don't have, again, have to bother their agent. Personally, I say stay away from that. If I have my clients going to open houses, Ideally, I want to be in those open houses with them so I can walk them through the property and give them my advice on that particular property. When you work with my team and you do want to go to open houses, I at least go ahead and reach out to the listing agent to tell them that, hey, my clients are coming through. Because what's the real reason for an open house? It's usually not to sell the property. It is generally a way that agents try and meet new clients. So anytime you go into an open house, if your agent is not with you, keep your mouth shut and uh, you know, be friendly, but that's about it. Next, don't be fooled by staging. Staged properties sell for more. If the furniture is beautiful, none of that comes with it. So make sure you understand what you're getting in the sale. And just because a property is dirty or maybe not totally cleaned up and beautiful, doesn't mean it's not the best deal out there. And also I want you to know that generally speaking, vacant properties sell for the lowest amount because you can obviously see all of the flaws. So there's some really good opportunities in what we call dirty house, dirt cheap, or some vacant properties. 
After all of that, let's say you found the perfect place and yes, you're ready to go to write an offer. Well, any offer has four very important factors in it. Number one, obviously, is price. Everyone focuses only on price. I'm going to tell you it is not always the biggest determining factor. It's very, very important, but at some point, there are three other things that are extremely important in any offer. The second one is dates. How quickly or slowly do you want to move versus what the seller wants to do? Often, we can see lower prices as a result of a motivated seller wanting to sell quickly or stay longer. So this is something to consider. And this may also be a factor for you because maybe you are renting, maybe you're getting evicted, or maybe you've still got six months on a year-long lease. Dates can be extremely important and very often they come in the way of a purchase. Next up, size of the deposit. Let's say, for instance, you're in competing offers and you come up with a $1,000 deposit and the competing offer comes up with a $100,000 deposit. Well, obviously, one person looks a whole lot more serious than the other one. So the size of your deposit does matter. And again, shoot for about 5%. And if you're in competing offers, you may want to look at even higher numbers. And then number four on my list for the important factors is the amount of conditions you have. Conditions are also often known in my market as subjects. This means this is due diligence that you still have to do in order for the sale to come together. Now, there are many different types of conditions or subjects that you can have. However, these are the most common. One is a property disclosure statement. This is a form filled out by the seller and it reviewed by the buyer that tells the buyer all about the property from the seller's point of view. Again, I do have another video on the channel all about property disclosure statements and the fact that, well, this is actually the form of where a lot of lawsuits come from. So disclosure, uh, I highly recommend you ask for a disclosure statement. If a property is currently tenanted or vacant, you may not. Next is title. Uh, here at McDonald Realty, my company, we search all the titles in advance and we actually get a lawyer to review them, hopefully prior to offers or at least prior to subject removal. On a detached home, titles are usually pretty easy to identify. On strata, there could be all sorts of charges that don't even really relate to your unit, but they are on the title. So that is something you can easily hopefully review. And if not, Hopefully your real estate company also pays for lawyers to review titles before going firm. Next up is insurance. You want to make sure the property can be insured. There are reasons why properties cannot be insured. Could be age, could be type of wiring, type of plumbing. You're gonna to wanna to make sure the property can be safely and cheaply insured. For instance, what if it's on a floodplain? Insurance is gonna be real tough. But just lately, within the last couple of years, if you're buying a strata property, you also wanna verify the strata's insurance because strata insurance has been trouble. This is, a, again, disclosure, title, and insurance are relatively easy subjects to satisfy. And if your agent is working hard for you, ideally, these should not even be conditions. They'll actually make your offer better if you don't have these conditions in and you satisfy them in advance of writing your offer. However, there are two conditions that are likely not going to be satisfied if you are writing an offer in advance of writing your offer, unless the market is really, really hot. And those are obviously financing and inspection. Starting off with financing in today's market, you might get five to seven business days to go ahead and get that final pre-approval done with the bank. Sure, you already have a pre-approval with your mortgage broker or lending institution, but at the same time, you now have to get the property appraised and financing has to be finalized. If a buyer comes to me and says, I need 14 days subject removal, or if your bank says, I need 10 business days for subject removal, you need to move to a new bank because you're going to lose properties as a result of not having your financing happen fast enough. Inspection, that can happen really quick, but here's one thing I want you to do. I want you to not pay for your inspection before you go ahead and get your financing approved because financing getting approved is basically no cost. Inspection is going to be five or 600 bucks. So I would hate keep going into properties, paying for inspections, 500 bucks each time, and then not having the financing come through. And then of course, if you're buying a strata property, you're likely going to have a condition to strata documents. Now, again, if the property's hot and you want to make your offer as good as possible, 
often we can read these strata documents in advance of making an offer, but you're going to get things like two years worth of council minutes, bylaws, something called a form B, which is really, really important in regards to the strata. And you're going to review all of these documents to make sure you're happy with the building. You're looking for things like maintenance that may not even be relevant in the inspection because you may not see things like boilers in an inspection or the roof. And then you also want to check out their financials and hey for instance if the bylaws say there's no barbecues allowed on the patio and you like barbecuing you might not want to buy that property and kind of new and I mentioned earlier here in BC is now the cooling off period otherwise known as the buyer's right of rescission now in a hot market buyer's right of rescission is going to come into play in a cool market much less so here's the overall idea the buyer has three days from any offer to walk away from that contract for any reason for a fee. Now you can see if you have seven day financing conditions, you don't need a three day buyer rescission period. However, it will be in your contracts. So if you don't get financing in four days, you can walk away. There's no reason why you would pay a fee to walk away in three days. I've got videos at nauseum on my channel about the buyer rescission period and how totally ridiculous it is. And again, if you want to learn more about that, I would love to have a conversation with you. However, realistically, buyer right of rescission is only going to come into play when the market is really, really hot and people are writing unconditional offers. And then yes, you do have three. Now those are business days. So last week I wrote an offer on a Wednesday. The rescission period went Thursday. Thursday, Friday, and then not Saturday and Sunday and finished on Monday. So those people actually kind of had a five day condition period, even though the offer was unconditional. Confusing, right? I know. But let's say for instance, all of this comes together and we present your offer for you and you get an accepted offer. Well, let's, let's back up just a little bit. It is very important on how your realtor presents the offer. We used to do it pre-COVID in person every single time. These days, that is much less common. However, you want to make sure that your agent is still presenting your case. If you're coming in with a low offer, why are you coming in with a low offer? You want to make sure that the agent you hire is promoting you as the best buyer for that property. Because honestly, most people want to sell to other really nice people. So yeah, it does pay to tell them your story about how you like this or you want the kids to go to the school down the street or you really like the neighborhood and here's a picture of my dog, right? Like these are all ways that your agent should be able to present your offer and those should not put you in a negative negotiating position. However, most offers that I receive as a listing agent, they come with nothing. And then we're just negotiating with someone who we don't know the story of, we don't know their financing. So I have to dig into all of that. So make sure your agent is willing and ready to present your offer in a way that best represents you. So now let's say we get the accepted offer. Well, now likely if we're not firm and we're not going into the buyer rescission period, we likely have a due diligence period. Let's call it five to 10 days. And this is where we're going to finish off our due diligence. This is make the mortgage broker or mortgage specialist happy time. Give them all the paperwork they need, finalize everything, do the inspection, read the minutes, and get your deposit ready. Because as soon as that time period is done, if you want to proceed with the property, you need to now remove those conditions from the contract and pay your deposit at that time. And that's it. If you did that, you bought a property. If you remove those conditions and pay that deposit. Now, in that contract, though, you have negotiated a closing date. And let me break this down for you. Anything within 30 days is a very quick close. 60 to 90 days is what we call a regular close, you know, two to three months between signing off on the property and actually getting into the property. Now, you don't want to go above 120 days. The reason for that is most banks, a couple of banks, I think BMO maybe will hold 130 days, but most banks will not hold your pre approval for that long and you may have to re-qualify. And if market conditions change, you could be in a real bad spot. So ideally you should be looking for a 60 to 90 day close. Now in that time, you're gonna go ahead and sign with the bank and finalize your mortgage and pick, do you want variable or fixed and all those fine details. Then right around the completion date, you're going to go sign with the lawyer. Now there are two important dates. There's actually three important dates in the contract, but let's focus on these two. Completion is the day that the money changes hands. That's the day you own the property. But possession is the day you get keys. Here in BC, those are written into the contract and often completion might be on a Wednesday and you might not get keys until Saturday at noon. 
So it's very important to understand that your insurance will have to be valid for the completion date and not the possession date because you own it on the completion date. And if something goes wrong between completion and I don't know, possession, let's say for instance, the owner moving out for some reason has a kerosene lamp collection and knocks one over and burns down the house. That's your house that they just burned down. So you wanna make sure your insurance is valid again for the completion date and not for the possession date. Now, if you're selling your property as a side note, yes, you should for sure on the other end of things have insurance all the way through your possession time. So now you've completed, it's possession day. How do you get your keys? Well, here in BC, we don't get keys from lawyers like they do in so many places. Your agent will actually arrange to get keys from the other agent and the homeowner and then meet you at the property, usually do some sort of a walkthrough and make sure everything is in order. And that's it. Congratulations, you bought a house. So get clean in it because it's probably been left a whole lot messier than you like because, well, the last people were worried about their new place, not their old place. So cleaning for sure every single time, even if the house is clean, trust me, you're going to want to clean it again. And then you get to spend the next five to 10 years making it your own. But you will then have to set up and maybe your lawyer's done this for you at closing. Maybe not. Depends on the law firm. You may want to contact your strata corporation if you're buying a strata unit and set up future strata payments to come out by direct withdrawal. Also, you want to make sure your mortgage payment comes out correctly. Now, my experience is I've never had a single first mortgage payment ever be correct. I don't know what it is about the banking system. My first payment, always something wrong. But remember, let's say, for instance, I move in on the 15th of the month. My first mortgage payment is going to be the first, but it's not a full month's payment. It is only going to be the interest portion from the 15th to the first because rents are paid in advance. Mortgages are paid afterwards. So your first full proper mortgage payment won't come out until maybe the first of the following month after you move in. But if you are on a regular paycheck kind of schedule, I would line up my mortgage payments to be every two weeks with my paycheck. And well, I think that about covers it. Successfully getting through all of that means that you have just purchased your first home. But there is a very big factor in your first purchase that I have not covered yet in this video. And well, that is because that factor is always changing. And that factor is actually many factors called the market and market conditions include things like months of inventory, days on market, list to sell ratios, new and active listings, sales volume, and a whole lot more that you can only stay up to date on by subscribing to the channel, clicking the like button and tuning back in in a couple of days. Or you can just book a call with me right now using the link in the description below.